Hola, ¿qué tal a todos? Mi nombre es Cristian Jiménez y bienvenidos a este espacio llamado God Science, Ciencia, Cultura y Teología desde una perspectiva cristiana. Y bueno, en esta ocasión les traemos un diálogo muy importante. Sin duda fue una conversación histórica entre dos figuras de gran renombre en el mundo académico, en el mundo teológico. Por un lado tenemos al Dr. Francis Collins, un genetista muy destacado. Hasta hace poco fue el presidente de eh, los Institutos Nacionales de Salud de los Estados Unidos. Y por otra parte, bueno, ya tenemos a, al gran conocido Richard Dawkins, un ateo, militante, eh, defensor del evolucionismo, catedrático de Oxford. Y bueno, uh, tuvieron una conversación hace un par de semanas en el programa Unbelievable, dirigido por Justin Burley. Y si bien no fue un debate como tal, Ambos presentan los argumentos que parecen más convincentes para cada uno de ellos. Eh, también comparten un poco de sus historias de conversión o de fe, si en algún momento eh, la tuvieron, como fue el caso del profesor Dawkins. Sin duda es un, es un diálogo muy rico, muy interesante. Sabemos que hemos estado inactivos durante algún tiempo y les pedimos disculpas a todos. Ya estaremos hablando sobre ello, pero por mientras les dejamos esta conversación para que la disfruten, tomen notas y por supuesto se mantengan atentos a lo que estaremos haciendo más adelante. Que disfruten este fin de semana y que Dios les bendiga. Well, hello and welcome to The Big Conversation from Premier Unbelievable with me, Justin Briley. The Big Conversation brings the biggest thinkers together to discuss the biggest questions in science, faith and philosophy. I'm joined on today's show by Richard Dawkins and Francis Collins to talk about biology, belief and COVID. Richard Dawkins is Emeritus Professor of the Public Understanding of Science at Oxford University. He's a world-renowned scientist. His book, The Selfish Gene, is a classic of evolutionary biology. But Richard, of course, is well known also for his critiques of religion as an atheist. Uh, his book, The God Delusion, was a bestseller when it was published. And his most recent books include Outgrowing God, A Beginner's Guide to Atheism. Francis Collins is also a renowned geneticist who oversaw the Human Genome Project and was, until recently, director of the National Institutes of Health in the USA, leading their response to COVID, and just recently been appointed as acting science advisor to the president. Francis is a committed Christian. His 2006 book, The Language of God, A Scientist Presents Evidence for Belief, explained why he believes God and science do go together. He's also the founder of Biologos, an organisation that seeks to do the same. So today we'll be looking at the different journeys of these two men, why two eminent scientists come to such different conclusions about God, and looking at all the questions raised by science, atheism, Christianity and Covid in today's world. So Richard and Francis, welcome along to the programme. Thanks, Justin. Thank you. Um, I'm really privileged to have you both on the same call and to be able to, to do this with you. It's, it's been a real dream come true bringing you together. So thank you both for, for being here. Um, let's, let's just start, though, with, you know, reflections on, well, just about two years now uh, in this pandemic. Um, how has that impacted you? I'll start with you first, Richard. Um, what's, what's been your experience as we've come through this time? My personal experience has been that I've been able to get on with a lot more work. <laughs> I've written two books while being locked down uh, and um, so naturally I'm not pleased about everybody about people being ill and, and I've eagerly taken up every offer of vaccination that I could I could do um, and I've tried to um, insofar as I can influence anybody else try to persuade other people to get vaccinated as well I'm, I'm gobsmacked by the truly idiotic resistance to vaccination that seems to come from a kind of political, ideological stance. Um, and, but apart from that, no, I've, I've been working hard mm. under, under lockdown and really quite enjoyed it. Well, uh, is, are you returning to something a bit more like normal? I, I know that you've been doing a few more in-person events and that sort of thing recently. Yes, I did, a, I did an, a, um, a, a big event in London two days ago with a thousand people and um, Many of them were wearing masks in the audience. Some of them were not. Um, and then the next day, I did a, a podcast l live with with somebody. Mm. So yes, I was, we're starting to emerge a bit. The government, the British government, is emerging. I think a bit too fast, in my opinion. They've they've relaxed all lockdown restrictions just about just last week, I think. I think political pressure to do that, uh, and I, I think it's. I'm not an expert. I mean, Francis may may say about something about that. It seems to me to be premature. Mm. Well, we're, we're recording this. This won't go out at, at the time that we're recording. So the situation may have changed a little um, by the time this is broadcast. But of course, Fran yes. Francis, the 
I mean, obviously, you've been at very much at the forefront until very recently of the COVID response. Just, just, yeah. And responding to what Richard had to say there, I guess you've you've seen that as well up close and personal. The the politicisation of these issues that can often happen. Absolutely, I would say, and I hope history will take note of this, that the scientific community's response to this worst pandemic in more than a hundred years was absolutely stunning in its ability totally, to marshal the resources agree, yeah. to bring the technology forward. This whole mRNA vaccine approach, which was developed really over about 25 years, was just pushed forward at breathtaking pace. And we coordinated that from my role at NIH with industry, with academia, with the regulatory agencies, and to get those vaccines approved with 95% efficacy uh, in 11 months uh, was well beyond any expectation that any of us uh, would have tried uh, to claim. On top of that, what we were able to do with therapeutics, although most of them turned out not to be successful, we needed to know that too, uh, as well as the diagnostic testing where NIH basically got into the business of being a venture capital organization to get a lot of these technology platforms uh, scaled up and delivered so that now finally testing is widely available. All of those things, I, I just got to say, although it was exhausting, and I, was, I don't think I've worked this hard since I was an intern in medicine, to see the way in which people came together and insisted on rigor in everything was breathtaking. What was not so breathtaking was the response, certainly when it came to vaccines, uh, Richard already mentioned this, I didn't really anticipate that there would be such widespread resistance to take advantage of life-saving interventions, to have 50 million people in the United States still resisting vaccines because they have been misled uh, by conspiracies and just frank lies. I didn't think in such a technologically advanced country that, that would be such a huge thing. And it just shows you how everything has been contaminated by politics. Yeah. Um, do you feel like we're on the home straight now, as it were, Francis? Do you see a way out? <laughs> I'm a little bit reluctant uh, to claim that because it seems like we heard that last summer and then Delta came along. Mm -hmm. And then it looked like maybe we were getting past that. And then Omicron mm -hmm. came along. Are we really so confident there's not another variant out there waiting for us that might be sufficiently different from what we've seen so mm. far that our immune response won't be as good as we'd like? I hope maybe we're going Darwin to... Darwin would not be confident anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I'm with Darwin on this one. You know, Richard, if you yes. wanted a lesson about how evolution works, the whole story of SARS-CoV-2 yeah. is yeah. breathtaking in its detail. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I, I'm sure there will be many a science book written just from the biological perspective on, on the lessons this has taught us uh, in years to come. But let, let's start with your, your stories, um, as, as I promised we would. And I would love to talk about the science, both of COVID and, and generally of genetics and the evolutionary story before we get to the questions of faith that, that we're going to talk about, too. But um, I, I mean, as I said, Richard, you've, you've been well known as, as an atheist as much as a scientist in the recent decades. Um, at what point did you sort of come to the settled belief that God and science essentially don't mix? Was that something you sort of decided fairly, fairly early on in your life? About 16, I suppose. Um, um, my, 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 my lingering uh, religious faith had been uh, based upon my wonder at the natural world, the, the beauty, the elegance of the, of the biological world. And uh, so I retained a belief in some kind of creator, because I felt that that level of complexity needed a designer. And then when I finally understood the full magnitude of the Darwinian explanation, then that dropped away. And, and I, I decided that there was no need for that. And not only no need for it, but it was actually as a counter to uh, what, what I took evolutionary science to be about. And, and and so that view, I mean, essentially, would you say that it was your science that sort of led you further down the path towards the kind of view of atheism that, that there is ultimately no God? Yes, I would say that. It, it, in the case of my friend Christopher Hitchens, uh, it was a bit different. I think in his case, it was more, more of a political moral uh, reason. And that I was always less interested in that than, I, than in, the, in the scientific aspect. And, and in a sense, what prompted you in the end to turn from primarily being someone who, you know, 
talked about the science, published books in that area too. Obviously, you know, what, what you've been very well known for in the last 15 years or so with The God Delusion, what, what was it that prompted you to want to really nail your colours to that mask? Well, it's a, it's a minor part of what, what I've been doing. Virtually all my books are, are about science, and that's what, I, that's what I would wish to be remembered for. Mm, sure. um, and then I, I think it was probably... Uh, I, I was not very happy about the election of George W. Bush, although nowadays, with hindsight, <laughs> compared to Trump, it's a, it sort of I felt, you know, come back, George W. It, it, we, all is forgiven. Um, but uh, um, it, it, it was the, the, the feeling that um, that there was a kind of religious takeover in a way. I mean, he, he, was, he wasn't really that religious but it, that's what it felt like at the time and mm. um my literary agent john brockman who had been discouraging me from writing a book about religion he said you can't sell that in america uh then after george bush had been in power for for, for a while um he said now's the time to write it and so i did right francis remind us of your story briefly um you became a christian um a, as an adult so to just explain the circumstances of that Sure. When I was 16 or 17, uh, I was also uh, pretty convinced there was no need for God at all. I had not been raised in a home where faith was considered relevant. And I went on to graduate school in quantum mechanics and uh, enjoyed the experience uh, of trying to use mathematics to understand the universe and felt there was no need for anything else beyond that. Uh, my comeuppance, uh, if you want to call it that, I was going then to medical school because I had this urge to see how science could apply to the human condition in beneficial ways. And I was really excited about DNA in that regard. And then I began to realize there were questions that science wasn't helping me with. Like, why am I here anyway? Um, what happens after you die? Is there a God? Why is there something instead of nothing? And I began to realize I was a bit impoverished in the ability to approach those things. I set about, therefore, trying to understand how people had answered those questions and quickly found myself in theological quarters uh, and thought I would be able to shoot down all their arguments uh, to my surprise and particularly influenced by the writings of C.S. Lewis. I realized that my arguments were actually pretty superficial and ultimately over a two-year period with a lot of kicking and screaming, came to the conclusion that faith was more rational than atheism for me, and ultimately that faith had to have an anchor, and that anchor became uh, the God of Abraham, and ultimately I recognized the person of Jesus Christ as a historical figure about which we know a great deal as an answer to a lot of the problems that I otherwise couldn't solve. And reading the words of Matthew 5 and 6, the Sermon on the Mount, recognized there the kind of truth about how to live that I wanted to embrace. So I became a Christian at 27 and I've been there ever since. And obviously in today's discussion, you're going to be talking about the reasons for that and the way it intersects with your science, but it hasn't certainly hasn't stopped you being great friends with many non-religious folk. Um, if I wanted to mention that, um, you know, you, you do have a shared connection with Christopher Hitchens, who you mentioned earlier, Richard, um, because it, I was reminded just this past week that you were quite involved, certainly in his final months, in 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 his uh, helping him medically um, during his cancer diagnosis. Just tell us a little bit about that, because um, I, I stumbled across as well that beautiful tribute you did to him at the his memorial service as well. What what were the circumstances of you coming to, to know him in that way? Well, I got to know Hitch before his illness. Um, we were involved, as you might imagine, on opposite sides of this question about whether one can be a scientist and a believer in God. And he was a remarkably effective debater. And so anybody who's been on the other side of a conversation with Hitch knows what it's like to have uh, the verbal assaults that are both really effective and really funny. And uh, I've always kind of thought this is a good thing. Iron sharpens iron. Uh, debating a little bit with Hitch, mostly privately, uh, was actually helpful to sort of figuring out my own weaknesses in terms of arguments about faith. But we became friends and I would go and drop by his apartment and uh, we would drink wine and uh, he would drink scotch and we would uh, discuss everything from faith to George Orwell to Thomas Jefferson to whatever else was on his mind. Uh, an incredible mind he had. 
And then he got sick uh, and he was suddenly diagnosed with already very advanced esophageal cancer. And I was glad to try to help uh, to see if there was something that could buy some time. And I think we did buy him some time, actually with some genomic analysis of his cancer to figure out what would be the most effective therapy. And perhaps uh, he was with us for an extra six or nine months. And I was quite close to him during that time. Um, he never wavered, unless anyone say otherwise, and, and his atheism. But he was a gracious friend uh, to me. And I think uh, we both enjoyed that experience, uh, even though we disagreed rather deeply on life's most important question, is there a God? A any thoughts on that as well from yourself, Richard? I, I know that, that Hitchens, in a sense, were quite quite interesting in that way. He he really did actually genuinely have friends across the aisle, um, course, despite yeah. his you know strongly held positions himself. I, w I was aware, Francis, of the of, of what you were doing for him, and and um, uh, in, on on behalf of people, as it were, on my side of the aisle, we, we felt very really grateful to you for for what what you were you were doing. <laughs> Just looking at the atheist movement, that in a sense yourself and Hitchens and others have, have represented the so-called new atheism of the last 15 years or so, Richard, and you may not wear that badge yourself, I'm sure, but um, the that movement itself has almost changed quite a bit since Hitchens was with us. Um, it almost feels to me like the secular humanist movement itself has gone, gone on a number of splits and we're seeing the same kinds of political issues and so on dividing it as we're seeing, you know, that affect Francis and others. Um, I mean, what, what's your feeling about where, where that's gone? And I know that you yourself have sort of been sort of, you know, cancelled by some people and, and that sort of thing. What, what do you think of the movement, as it were, if you can call it a movement that, that Hitchens and yourself were part of and, and where it sort of exists today in that way? You know, Justin, I'm not that interested in that kind of thing. I'm, in, it, I'm, I'm interested in what's true, not, not how many mm -hmm. people think this or how many people think that. Um, if if there are, if there are trends and in, in society towards this movement or that movement, who cares? I mean, let's talk about what's true. And can we talk about science? I was hoping we might begin by talking about absolutely. Yeah. Let's talk about the science. Um, you you both believe in obviously a long evolutionary history and the way in which that genetic makeup that makes up you, me, and every living thing on the earth has has, if you like, a a, a point of origin uh, in the past. Um, Obviously, for you, Richard, this is part of the reason you, you are an atheist, presumably. You, 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 you know, you, you, you said that Darwin, you know, made it possible to be a fulfilled atheist because he mapped out the way in which that nat process of natural selection could gradually bring about the kinds of complex organisms that for a long time people had assumed w must be the work of a creator and so on. Um, and so I'll I'll start with you, Francis, for where you go with that, because I'm sure that's an argument you've heard many times uh, of why it, God should be, as it were, relegated. That you know, there's no need now for the God explanation when it comes to the area of science that you have spent your life devoted to, and yet here you are, a very committed Christian. So so just map out for us why, for you, the fact that there is an evolutionary explanation for the development of of complex life does not necessarily exclude God uh, in the process. Well, it actually makes me even more in awe of the creator, but let me explain. I, the, the argument from design, uh, which Richard talked about, uh, which had impressed him uh, when he was younger than 16 and then sort of fell apart <laughs> in the face uh, of the evolutionary explanation. I guess that argument from design has never really grabbed me, maybe because I was already deep into the science before I started asking these questions about faith. But certainly uh, evolution is incredibly powerful as an explanatory science to understand the amazing diversity of creatures uh, that we see around us and that we know have lived in the past. But I don't see how that in any way excludes the possibility that there was a plan. It's just for me that steps further back. And if God had the intention of uh, ultimately uh, putting forward on this uh, small blue planet somewhere on the outer edge of a galaxy, uh, creatures with big brains who would have conversations like this and who might even be interested in whether there is something beyond what they could see materially, uh, wouldn't evolution have been a very elegant way to do so? And if God, who's in my sense outside of space and time and therefore doesn't require uh, a way uh, to have been begun, uh, use this process 
and knew full well how it would happen because of this ability to be outside of time. Uh, I think that's just an amazing concept that brings together what I find to be really important questions about the something versus nothing and the meaning of life together with what I know as a scientist. Because my prior for whether there's a God was not zero. It was like maybe. And as I began to look around and I wrote a bit about this in the language of God and the BioLogos website has lots more about it, there were in fact evidences, not proofs, we're not given that, but evidences even from science itself that something seems interesting here about the nature of the universe as if it, as Freeman Dyson once said, almost knew we were coming. Yeah, and and in that sense, it's it's a sort of it's it's a holistic picture that draws you obviously to that conclusion, not just looking at a DNA or one particular thing. Um, I mean, Richard, again, you'll you'll be familiar with these sorts of arguments as well. What, how how would you respond? Well, Francis started to stray into the more or difficult f- physics, the cosmology, the origin of all things but there. But let's just stick to evolution for the moment. Um, <laughs> I I think if I were God and I wanted to create life, maybe even human life, uh, which is part of the expectation of a religious person, I think I would not use quite such a a wasteful, long drawn out process. I think I just go for it. I mean, why would you choose? um, Why would you choose natural selection? uh, Which has the possibly unfortunate property that it could have come about without you. Why would God have chosen a mechanism to unfold his design? He chose the very mechanism which actually makes him superfluous. Admitted he could have started it off and said, let's, I mean, God the experimenter is another matter. If, if he was, if his aim was a, an experiment to see, I wonder what would happen if I set up uh, a primeval self-replicating molecule and then Leave it to see what leave it to see what happens. That's that would be a really interesting experiment. And if God's an experimenter, I, I sympathise with that. But if he <laughs> if he wanted to make complex life, I think I wouldn't choose that astonishingly wasteful, profligate, um, cruel actually mm. way of I mean, doing. Natural selection is cruel. Well, cruel from a human perspective, in a sense, if you put a value on it, I suppose. Oh, yes. And, in and, that and sense. We are human. Uh, and and um, the, yes. the, 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 the suffering which, which comes from the fact that it's all about competition, it's all about is evading starvation. The ones that die are the ones who starve to death or eaten by predators, uh, consumed by disease. Um, it's, it's, it's not a benign process at all but that's not a, a very important argument i just was it, it st- struck me as francis was talking i'll i'll allow francis to answer it in just one moment we're just going to go to a quick break and we'll be back um we're talking about evolution faith atheism covid as well i'm sure we'll come to in the course of our conversation so so pleased to be joined today by francis collins and richard dawkins here on the big conversation from premier unbelievable and we'll be back in just a moment's time Hey there, hope you're enjoying the conversation. I'd love to know how you respond. Please click the survey link with the video and tell us what you thought. It's multi-choice and really quick. Plus, what I want to ask is this. We've a bonus conversation to share with you where Richard grills Francis about genetics. Just register for our newsletter and we'll send you the additional video of Francis and Richard talking in depth about the frontier of biology and genetics. Again, the sign up link is with today's video and our website, thebigconversation.show. Welcome back to today's show. We're talking about biology, belief and COVID. My guests are Francis Collins and Richard Dawkins. Um, so just in that last section, Francis, you know, Richard's saying, and I think it's it's a very common question. If God were going to create life, why this process, which on the face of it takes so long, um, is so cruel and wasteful in many ways. And, you know, arguably, Richard says, God's somewhat superfluous. So it's hardly as though it's providing great evidence for <laughs> or a designer anyway. Um, so yeah, where, where do you go with um, that? Those are all really appropriate questions and I, I wrestle with some of those uh, myself. Point out the, a couple of things though. Uh, one is that I don't think the fact that it took a long time 
uh, should trouble us particularly. From God's perspective, uh, yeah, it's a long time for us. But again, in this view where God is pretty much outside of space and time, it's a blink of an eye with a full knowledge of where the outcome would occur. Um, also, I guess, Richard, one of the things that I have come really to appreciate about this model is it says that God is really interested in order. God is not so uh, excited about the idea of just snap the fingers and then here we all are. God wanted a universe that was going to follow these elegant mathematical laws, which, by the way, is one of those signposts that I see of an intelligence behind the universe. Einstein would have agreed with that part as well. An intelligence that also wanted it to be interesting. We could get into those constants that determine the behavior of matter and energy that seem to be just in this precise place to make something interesting happen. So if you want to accept the idea that there is some intelligence behind here, it's a pretty darn good mathematician and physicist and seems really interested in laws of nature and natural order. And so if you're going to go that way and yet you still are interested in Richard Dawkins uh, coming into being, well, evolution's a pretty darned impressive way to get there. Yes, I get it from our human perspective, not the way we would have done it, but I'm always a little careful when I say, well, God should have done this differently because I would have had a better plan. And I'm, I'm me and God is God. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a small point, really. I mean, I, I think to, for, for me, a, a bigger point is is not to stress the, the fact that God is not necessary. I'm, and I think he is not necessary. But that's what most people say. I want to go further than to say he's not he's not necessary. Somehow he really, really gets in the way of um, the fact that the Darwinian explanation so beautifully does away with the need for any kind of top down design. The Darwinian explanation uh, is a powerful antidote to the feeling that we all have because we're human that when things are complicated they need to be put together by somebody in a top-down design kind of way um and if you under really understand that the evolutionary process starts with with simplicity and builds up to complexity and elegance and beauty and a uh, strong illusion of design then to smuggle design in again at the beginning is to betray the entire enterprise which you've spent so long working out and, build, and build, building up. The enterprise has been, we now understand that you don't actually need a designer for uh, it to explain complexity. It really can come about. That's a beautiful idea, the idea that complexity and the illusion of design can happen according to the unguided laws of physics. I said can happen. Now, once you've established that it can happen, to suddenly say, oh, well, we, we better have God in any way, is a betrayal of that whole argument. So I want to say that design comes in late in the universe. I fully expect that elsewhere in the universe there may be creatures far more intelligent and complex than we are, <clears throat> but they too will have come about by the same process of gradual, incremental, step-by-step, -step, climbing up the ramp change. It is a betrayal of everything that Darwinism, it seems to me, stands for, to smuggle in a creator. Once you've got rid of him, then you really, let's just bring him back because it feels good to bring him back kind of thing. <laughs> okay. Francis. Well, it, it's a lot more than feels good. I think it can be articulated as a rational choice. But basically, uh, Richard, I am arguing not uh, that uh, the evolutionary process is incapable <clears throat> of generating complexity. I think it totally is. You and I are in the same place here. Absolutely. As far as the we're, we're, no, there's no approach. doubt about that. Yeah. Right. But you said that, uh, well, it's happened just because of the laws of physics. I want to take this back to that step. Where did those come from? Well, let's get to that then, because because you keep getting to that. And, and that, I believe that's a, that's a very profound. Um, I mean, if if somebody was going to convince me of the need for, for a God, it, it would be there. It, it would be not in my own field of 
of biology, and I, and I found. Mm. I mean, I've I've, I've read uh, the language of God, and, in, and indeed I read reread it today. Um, had, I read it, read it first when it, it came out. I love your song, by the way. That's really nice in the in the audio version. <laughs> I, I I listened to the audio version today. Um, I don't know whether you've had Justin, but um, the. I, I haven't, I'm afraid. I, I'll have to tr- include it in the in the program at the end or something, so people can can hear it. I I found the initial C.S. Lewis part about th- about the moral uh, argument really profoundly unconvincing. Um, when you when you get onto the physics, when you get onto we, well, we should get to that then. <laughs> well, we, we, yeah. Okay. <laughs> when 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 you come on later to the. Um, origin of the physical constants now that's getting on uh, getting warm that getting close to a good argument um, uh, unlike the unlike the morality one um <laughs> well is that is that mainly because it is a essentially a scientific well, argument no 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 it's, it's obviously much, it's the, the more area difficult you're, than that. you're happiest it's, with it's, it's that the the physical constants um things like the speed of light gravitational constant um and strong and weak force and things um Physicists agree, most physicists agree, that if you, if you change any of those constants by even a very, very small amount, then we, 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 we don't come into existence. The universe doesn't come into existence. Mm. They have to be like that in order for galaxies to form, for stars to form, for chemistry to form, actually. Um, mm. and, and then for, uh, for, for the prerequisite for life to evolve uh, needs that as well. So that's the nearest approach to a good argument. By the way, I want to be very careful about this because I once said that, um, and and the I, I'm not going to mention the name of the man I was having having a debate with. Um, he he seized onto that later, and then I think a couple of days later he went up to Scotland and said, "Dawkins is a convert. Um, he's he's." he's, he's <laughs> Oh, or not, 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 not quite that. I, th- I think what you, what a- you gave an inch and he took a mile. I- exactly. Yes. Um, I, I, uh, yeah. Well, well, look, I, 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 I'm very familiar with this argument as well. Often called the the argument for God from fine tuning. It's it's it is essentially a design argument. It's saying you know yes, yeah. look at the extraordinary fine tuning of these uh, initial constants of the universe. If they differed from their actual value just a tiny bit we wouldn't have a universe capable of producing life and yet here we are it needs an explanation one of the explanations on the table is a designer behind behind the whole thing um and and when you look at the you know the the extraordinary numbers we're talking about you can see why it does you know even for someone like you richard you know you'd say if there were an argument it might be this one and actually i've heard many other atheists say that um peter milliker i think hitchens um you know all said okay that might be the one if if you were gonna you know crack the door open a little bit um so but i think i think what you were coming to richard is is why you still think this is um you know you're still essentially pointing to a, a gap and, and filling well, it yes, with god is that your I mean, problem it, it, because with, it seems with this? To me, you, all you're doing is pushing it back a stage and you've still got, got to explain god right. you're, you're, you're saying um we need an explanation for the fine tuning and so we postulate a fine tuner um but you haven't mm-hmm. explained anything i mean you've, you've simply invented okay. you've magicked away the problem and and this is this this has been one of your your, your key arguments in, in your books, Richard, you know, just positing God just leaves you with something more complex to, to, to describe something. Well, more the, really the, the, there's that. Um, what, what's, but but, but yes. I think but, but also but, yes. um, you, you might convince somebody like me to be a deist. But then you suddenly say, OK, well, because of ah, he's converted. Did you hear that? <laughs> right <here. laughs> because, because, because of the fine tuning ar- argument. <laughs> But then suddenly, okay, then then we get Jesus Christ, and then we get crucifixion, then we get then we get we get resurrection, we get virgin birth. That's nothing to do with it. I mean, that's a, that's a, a whole that's a, a, a positively dishonest way of smuggling in um, what you what you really want, or well, not you, but I mean what what some Christians really want, which is to, which is to bring bring in Jesus or, or, right. or Allah and Muhammad or, or Buddha, whatever it is. You cannot do that. I mean, you've, you've got either you're going to stick with a fine tuning argument, which is a good argument, or you've got to p- produce a really good argument for Jesus. But don't think that because you've 
convince somebody of the, by the fine-tuning argument to be a deist, that therefore he's then got to believe in Jesus. <laughs> right, sure, sure. Well, let, let's take those one at a time. Maybe, Francis, start with the, this, this problem that Richard has of, look, is God a satisfactory explanation? You know, uh, aren't you just substituting uh, a mystery with a mystery uh, at this point? Oh, yeah, let, let's tackle that. Uh, I, I'm glad uh, that we all kind of agree the fine tuning is a puzzle uh, that seems to ask for some kind of explanation. Uh, the Goldilocks Enigma, I think, was the title of the book about this. And it is really remarkable just how fine tuning that fine tuning is. The alternative, of course, is to postulate that there are an infinite number of, of other universes that have different settings of those particular constants, and uh, we could only be in one where it happened to work, so that's why we're observing it from here. Of course, we don't expect there will ever be an experimental means of uh, actually detecting the presence of those universes, so that's a, a bit of a leap of faith as well. But I go a little beyond just the fine-tuning argument, also to the argument about the Big Bang and what came before that. And here, Richard, is where I don't agree with your argument that if you say God is the creator who actually set this all in motion and, as you have said, twiddled the dials uh, for these constants, that then you need to create a, a reason or a creator of God uh, to start the whole thing off. Because again, I think of God as being outside space and time, so all of our arguments about how you have to have a beginning and an end don't apply anymore. Because if God is actually locked into space and time, you've got an infinite regress problem. But I don't think that's the case once you postulate a much broader sense of what the existence of God would be like. But you do think that God is a satisfactory explanation for that beginning. Do. You think that there has to be something like a God to explain why there is anything at all? I think that's France. entirely rational and defensible as a position to take. It doesn't prove it, of course. Uh, and again, I'll say, as I did earlier, I don't think we're going to discover a proof of God in this conversation, but it's consistent. And then, Richard, as far as going from those arguments uh, to the resurrection, no, of course, that, that requires, and I went through that for two years, kicking and screaming, as I said, it's kind of like the base camp. Richard, you've made it to base camp, but at the top of the mountain, there's a cross, and it might just be a little bit more of a trek to get up there. That was my trek, at least, because I encountered a t total sense of unease and dissatisfaction at stopping at the deist version of God because of this issue about good and evil, and where does that come from, and how do we put that into the equation of who we are and who God might be? I, I must stress once again, I, I'm not a deist, and, and I don't want to, to be. I've been, I've been burned by that, by that <laughs> before. Um, okay, you're not a deist. Yet. <laughs> We're yeah. squashing those rumours right the, away. The thing, okay. the thing about God being out outside time, and therefore, therefore, um, you know, with one bound, Jack was free. You, you. It's so easy. I mean, it's it's, it's such a a facile, easy way to do it. You just just sort of say, well, we've got this problem of the of the of the origin of the universe, what what came before the Big Bang, I know. Let's make God outside time. That'll do it. And it's just too easy. It's just not. Um, I find that uh, unimpressive. Um, Is it rationally indefensible, or well, it's just uncomfortable? <laughs> it, I think it, it smacks of just again redefine, just in, inventing a new. Um, uh, it's a sort of cop out from actually providing a proper explanation. Now, my physicist friends actually don't see it, see it as a problem. Um, the uh, the metaverse, um, the, the, sorry, the multiverse. Um, my understanding, and of course, I'm not a physicist, and and you you have the advantage of me there as a physical scientist. Um, but what I've heard from my physicist friends is that. Actually, the, the multiverse is something that comes from other aspects of physics, something that uh, that comes from inflation. And and I don't uh, I'm not a physicist enough to understand that. But but I would be less convinced by the multiverse if it was just invented for the purpose of solving this problem of fine tuning. But my understanding is that that's not the case, that it already was a prediction or is a prediction of other reputable aspects of physics, I think especially the inflation theory. I may have got that wrong. But, um. 
Yeah, that, that's fair. And if you go to the BioLogos website, which I will plug once again, uh, the current president of BioLogos, uh, Deb Harzma, is an MIT astrophysicist and certainly would put forward this notion that inflationary theory does permit the possibility of bubbling up of these other universes, not necessarily with different values of the constants, however. You've got to throw another big wrinkle in there uh, to make it That's possible important. to fit yeah. the explanation yeah. for the fine tuning. But I know Lawrence Krauss, as you do, and we've, we've had these conversations about exactly how much you can get there. What is troubling, though, and I would guess is troubling to you, too, as an experimental scientist, is that the ability to actually experimentally document uh, the existence of those other universes uh, seems almost to everybody uh, to be extremely unlikely, probably impossible. And that makes it an uncomfortable place to place all one bet. So if you've got these opportunities, you have a creator God on the one hand, and you have a theoretical prediction of multiverses that you will never be able to measure, you know, pick Occam's razor here. Which of those is a more plausible explanation? Kind of depends on whether you have a prior yeah. probability of God or not. And I do, and you don't. It, well, I was going to say, is, is the issue fundamentally, Richard, that, that you'll, you'll never be satisfied with a, an immaterial explanation. You'll always be, as a scientist in a sense, um, and as a materialist, let's face it, it, it you, you're, you're not going to sa be satisfied with anything but a, a material explanation for the material universe we live in. But that's part of it. I, I suppose um, perhaps we both come at it from a, with, a, with, with a bit of um, emotional... Not an emotional is the wrong word. A bit, a bit of presupposition. Um, as a, as somebody who's deeply steeped in evolution, um, I am kind of in love with the idea that it's possible to explain complex things in terms of simple things, and um, hmm. that's um, foreign to normal human nature. It's a difficult thing for humans to grasp and and Darwin's great gift to us, I think, is to show that big complex things come into can come into existence by an explicable, understandable, beautiful, elegant process of gradual evolutionary change. And that's such a beautiful idea that uh, inventing a big complex thing, which God must be if he exists, throws a ruddy great spanner in the whole works of the beauty of that Darwinian <laughs> concept of you, you, you don't like the way the universe looks with with. We're this both sort really of, talking yeah, about how messy we like the sort of explanation look, as far I, as you're I, concerned. I, I think that's yeah, probably yeah. 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 But I, I suppose Francis. Is, is God this, you know, complex sort of mysterious explanation as far as you're concerned for the Yes, I mean, God, God's got to be co co complex. Um, I mean, I, I have come across the theologians who say the beauty, the beauty of God, I think uh, Swinburne, uh, um, Rich, Richard Swinburne, the theologian, says God is totally simple. That's the beauty of him. You don't need a complex God. He is simple. And... I mean, that's ridiculous because if he's simple, he couldn't invent the fundamental constants and the laws of physics. And, and well, let, let's, Fra Francis, what's your view oh, on that? Oh, no, I think whatever ability uh, we humans have to try to imagine what God is really like, if God exists, and I believe he does, uh, is got to be so completely pathetic <laughs> compared to the reality of that complexity. Uh, and that um, awesome uh, capability as a physicist, mathematician, a mind. I think of God as a mind, not as some, you know, gray-haired guy in the sky, which has been an unfortunate image foisted on generations of believers. Uh, I don't think God has gender. I think God is a mind that is capable of things that you and I cannot possibly imagine. If he exists, then that must be what he is. Yep. Yes, if, if God exists. Now... You almost sound, Richard, that you would be disappointed ultimately if if that was the explanation. You would prefer that there be a sort of Darwinian explanation of the the universe itself. That that's sort of where your mind goes. You don't like the idea that there's actually is some kind of a mind behind. Yeah, it. that's a fair summary of what I just said. On the other hand, I I will say that I don't think this is a trivial question. I I think that 
whether or not there is a God is the biggest question you could ask, because scientific, actually it's a scientific question. Francis may disagree with that. Um, um, I, I think of it as a scientific question. Okay, why do you disagree, Francis? Well, it depends on what you set as the boundaries of a scientific question. I think Richard is getting at the fact that that means science is the only way to answer it. And I think if there is something outside of nature, and if God exists, God is definitely outside of nature, then the tools that we use to investigate nature, which is science, and it's really good at that, may not be adequate for this. So in that regard, I don't think it is a scientific question. I think you can explore possible bits of evidence, but I don't think you can prove yes or no to the God question solely with the tools of science. Well, you sort of have been in a way because you've been you've been using a scientific argument. I mean, the the the, the fine tuning argument is a is a, a scientific argument. And uh, what I would say is that it was the, not a proof. It was an inference. No, that's right. But it's it, it's a it's a plausibility argument. But it's a, it's using the methods of science. You're 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 saying that the phenomena the phenomena we see are that there are fundamental constants we don't understand, and they're fine tuned, and. Uh, a reasonable scientific model to account for that would be a supernatural mind. And I would say, I agree that, that uh, what, what I was trying to say was that a, a universe with a, a supernatural, with a, a creator mind, a creative intelligence, would be a totally different universe from one without. Uh, it would be um, a, a, a gigantically different problem we're trying to solve. If the if the the reason for the laws of physics is that somebody somebody made them up, then that is a, a scientific fact of profound importance. Um, a very different kind of universe from where for what it would be if nobody made them up. Yeah, point and point and, and, and is this where where you know you have this famous quote, Richard, which I'll I'll quote back to you now which is the universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at bottom no design no purpose no evil no good nothing but blind pitiless indifference now is that is that the universe you observe i suppose because i my suspicion is francis might say that's not well as a as a biologist it's, as a biologist it certainly is yes and 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 i suspect that i mean i, I think i intended that to be to be general and i still do um but it's it's evolutionary biology that gives me the impetus to 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 yes. maintain that. I, I I don't have the knowledge of physics to be to be can, so confident. Can, can I jump in and propose an alternative uh, to that very famous sentence uh, of Richards? Uh, I would argue that the universe has exactly the properties you would expect uh, if it was. Um, put there by God who desired creatures like us to exist, who can be morally responsible, um, who can love and care for each other, who can appreciate beauty, and who will know the difference between good and evil and will ultimately seek a relationship with God. The universe has those properties. But, but what, then then what about all the horrible horrible parasites and, and predators and, and COVID-19 and, and, and hurricanes and from earthquakes and, and, and uh, okay and, uh, um let's talk about poking horn and the con this yeah. concept of physical evil that you can't have it both ways for people who say god can do something just because they think god ought to be able to do it it doesn't make sense if it's like okay two and two could be five if god wanted it to be if you're going to set natural laws in place including evolution to ultimately result in something amazing and beautiful, creation, it's going to also do other things along the way. And God can't step in every whip stitch and avoid parasites. Uh, it's all part of the fact. But then, Francis, you can't have it both ways. You, you, you have it both ways when you believe in miracles. I mean, you, you cannot have a God who does miracles on the one hand, and yet who has this sort of, let's let the laws of physics play themselves out without interference on the other. You're having it both ways when you believe in miracles. I think I can have it both ways if God was the author of natural laws and in every instance except extreme exceptions where God has a message for people that he cares about, then God chooses uh, to interfere with his own natural laws and something like the resurrection happens. I don't find that to be intellectually inconsistent. But it's, it, God's betraying his own principles then. If his, if his principle is I'm going, to, I'm going to give them free will. I'm going, to, I'm going to let it all happen. I'm not going to interfere when, when there's a hurricane. I'm not going to save this child's life. Uh, 
then uh, on the other hand, you're saying that sometimes he does step in. So isn't that inconsistent? We have those great ganglions of history where something really critical needs to be conveyed uh, to God's people. Yes, as the author of natural laws, I believe God is entirely able to decide to briefly suspend them. But if it was doing that every time there was a hurricane, think of the chaos around us. How would we ever possibly manage to cope uh, with this world if we had no predictability of how matter and energy was going to behave? Well, I think that's your problem. <laughs> <laughs> well look <laughs> let's come back to this in a moment and let's maybe talk about covid as well we're just going to take another quick break and we'll be we'll be back in just a moment we're talking about science and faith today covid and god atheism and biology uh richard dawkins and francis collins join me on the big conversation today we'll be back in just a moment for more conversations between christians and skeptics subscribe to the unbelievable podcast and for more updates and bonus content, sign up to the Unbelievable Newsletter. Welcome back to today's show. Uh, the big conversation, really privileged to have joining me, Richard Dawkins and Francis Collins on today's edition of the show. Talking about biology, belief and COVID. And uh, I'll make sure there are links to both my guest websites from today's show. You can find out more about them, their books and uh, the causes and organizations that uh, they've created um i wanted obviously given that you have been at the forefront of the usa's response to covid francis and we started by talking about that uh to, to talk about that in scientific and theological terms and, and again given what we were just saying about richard's concerns that it's very difficult to understand you know if you are a christian who believes in a loving god who could intervene why God has allowed this kind of a universe to exist in, in which the natural laws take their, their uh, you know, the, the course they do. Um, perhaps just to, to put this into context, for those who may not be familiar with the biology, just, just give us a very simple sort of education on, on the COVID uh, virus and where, what, what, what caused it, how, why it's there, what, you know, the fact that obviously not all viruses are necessarily problematic or even we need some, uh, but that you know why this particular one has caused the amount of disruption and devastation that it has and and then where you see that fitting in if there is really a, a god behind this whole thing so there are more viruses uh, than there are stars in the universe these are incredibly widespread uh, they affect every organism. Bacteria have their own viruses. Uh, and there's this battle going on right now in your GI tract, whether you like it or not, between the viruses that are attacking your bacteria. And let's hope the right ones win. But viruses can also cause very serious illnesses, as we all know from things like smallpox and polio and now COVID-19. Viruses tend to be particularly dangerous for humans uh, when they jump across from other species. And that seems most likely to be what happened here, despite various conspiracy theories. By far and away, the most likely explanation is that this virus, which was being developed in a bat, perhaps traveling through another species, got into humans, possibly in the wet market in Wuhan, China. And there it found a host uh, that was very susceptible to its ability to multiply itself. It bound to human cells using a human protein on the surface called ACE2, which allowed that virus to get inside and then take over that host cell's machinery and replicate itself at, at a very rapid pace and then spread to other cells nearby. And furthermore, this virus was particularly good at making itself contagious to others around. Even people who weren't yet symptomatic could be very infectious, which is why SARS-CoV-2 has been such a bad actor and why so many people have gotten sick and died. So that is pretty consistent with what we know about other viruses. There's nothing particularly striking here, except maybe this very unusual way that people who aren't feeling sick can be super spreaders of the virus, which has made this one really successful. And of course, with evolutionary pressure, with so many people affected, mistakes made in copying the virus, most of which are deleterious, occasionally pop up with something that makes it even better at infecting people. That was alpha, and that was beta, and that was delta, and now it's omicron, and who knows what might be next. So how did this come about? Let's be clear. 
that this is probably, at least indirectly, a consequence of humans and animals getting really close together in ways that they traditionally have not. Bats living in caves in China generally didn't come in contact with a lot of humans, and now that's been more common. Same thing with influenza, as you all know, in terms of how that comes from birds or sometimes from pigs. This is a constant refrain, and I don't think we should blame God for that part. Now, in terms of the question about why would God allow this anyway, again, I come back to the fact that I see God as interested in natural order and having put in place this incredibly elegant process of evolution, it would not be appropriate to sort of say, oh yeah, but you can't make viruses evolution. <laughs> you got to leave that part alone. Uh, and actually viruses in many instances are actually part of the natural order and are not harmful, but occasionally they burst out like this. And I don't think we should blame God for that. What we should do is to try to take the tools of science, which I think are God-given. We have the intelligence to be able to figure these things out and use them uh, to come up with ways to prevent and treat the disease, which is what the scientific community has been doing, as I said at the beginning, with great intensity and great effect for two years. Richard, what, what's, firstly, just your position on the, 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 the actual science of, of how it came into being. I know that, you know, Francis obviously feels convinced that, that the, the, the Wuhan wet market is the, the most obvious explanation. Do you do, do broadly agree with I, that? I am insufficiently expert to say, and, and I simply uh, enjoy listening to Francis lay, laying it out. I mean, he, he's the expert. Um, I would say viruses, they, they, they do what viruses do. I mean, that, that's the whole point about the, the, my genes, I view of evolution, that, that the, 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 as it were, teleonomic um, entity in the living world is the gene. And viruses are just kind of almost pure genes with a bit of bit of protein to help them get about. Um, the 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 virus is the is is the the, the selfish gene re reductio. It's, it's 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 the sort of epitome of, of of a selfish gene, which does does what all genes are trying to do, which is to get into the next generation, and it does it in a in a peculiarly direct way without bothering to build a body in on the on the way i mean in um i've i've said that a a rhinoceros is genes way of making more rhinoceroses and 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 um uh it it, it it's it's a highly elaborate the the, the, the genome of a, of a rhinoceros is a highly elaborate computer program which says build more genes like us and Use, using the body of a rhinoceros as the as the vehicle for for doing so. Well, viruses don't need to bother about that. They just go for it. They just go for replication, mm. pure and simple. And it's entirely to be expected that, that they would exist. And bacteria are, they, a bit less direct, and so on. So um, I, I can take a kind of ghoulish satisfaction in the in the in the in the way that viruses simply do what. Darwin would have expected. I would put in plug for uh, Darwinian medicine, and here I, I, I pass this on to Francis as a, as a sort of senior medical scientist in in, in America. Um, there is a school of Darwinian medicine which uh, tries to look at disease from the point of view of the pathogen what what the pathogen is trying to do in in its its life which is to get itself propagated and at the same time look at what the patient is trying to do and um think when well an, an obvious example is is when a patient has a high fever um ask yourself whether the high temperature is is something that the doctor ought to be bringing down because it's unnatural or whether that the high fever might be actually an adaptation by the patient to kill the pathogen, in which case it might not be the best thing. It might be the best thing to allow. I mean, I'm sure you're familiar with that example, but, but there's a book which I recommend um, by uh, Randolph Nessie and George C. Williams, late, very distinguished evolutionary biologist, it's not called Darwinian medicine, but it should have been. Um, they gave it a, 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 a bad title, which is why we get sick. And 
a doctor is not going to buy a book called Why We Get Sick. He thinks he already knows. But, <laughs> but, but if, it, if it had been called Darwinian Medicine, I think a doctor might be interested in, in buying it. So the, I think the subtitle is, is, is Darwinian Medicine. Randolph Nessie and George C. Yeah. Williams. Um, and the fever example is just the first and a very obvious one. Much less obvious one is all the ailments of pregnancy, preeclampsia, that kind of thing. Um, can be explained as a result of, very elegantly explained, as a result of uh, an evolutionary conflict between the mother and the fetus, um, because they're not genetically identical, and the the fetus's genetic interest is somewhat selfish. It 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 it, it wants to to draw from the mother more resources than the mother evolutionary speaking, ought to give. And so the, the conflict can result in an evolutionary arms race, which um, the, the main work there is by David Haig of Harvard University, and that I think is discussed in the, in the book, um, uh, Darwin in Medicine. So um, any, any doctors listening in who are not familiar with this might like to look up that, that book. And, and on that subject, Francis, you know, given that you know you both believe that that in a sense evolution drives these these forces um that both the, the aspects of ourselves that that kind of tend towards our healing and uh you know our health and so on but also these forces that are in competition with us you know the the virus that wants to replicate itself and you know will use whatever host it can lay its hands on in the course of that for, for you this obviously for richard the, the, this doesn't sit well with the idea that there's a god uh, you know uh, on top of this whole thing but for you, you you're really happy to say it, it's actually it's the, the sort of the sharp end of the kind of deal we've got as it were as embodied conscious agents that that this is the kind of world god had to put us in in order for us to to be the kind of people we are is that is that what you're saying there that's what I'm saying. And, and to follow natural laws and order in the universe, just as uh, tectonic plates must slip in order for this planet uh, to be what it is. Uh, and so viruses must come into being if evolution is going to run uh, all of the programs that it has capable of doing uh, to generate interesting biological outcomes. And that, again, I come back to Polkinghorne's concept uh, that those things could be called physical evil when they actually harm and take the lives of innocent people. Uh, but they are a component uh, of the fact that we are in a universe that follows laws. And I don't think we'd want to be in one that didn't. I get I get that. And, and I mean, that 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 would be co a consistent position to take were it not for your belief in miracles. I mean, I, I say again, you can't have it both ways. I mean, I God should God should not be doing miracles if he if if what you say about about earthquakes is 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 correct. Uh, but if God hasn't, he's 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 betraying his own principles. Um, he is choosing because he is able to do so. Uh, those moments of remarkable importance to convey a message to his creatures. Uh, that would be you and me, uh, in a way that the miraculous may be able to achieve. And again, if God's the author of all of this, I don't see why God should not be allowed when it chooses so oh, his can. nature to uh, change uh, things. Yeah. He, he would have the power to, but then, you know, okay, I'm not going to intervene in this earthquake, um, that, because that would, because that would be, that would be inconsistent with, with the desire to let things play out. But I am going to intervene, um, to, um, heal, the, um, well, whatever it was called, Jairus's daughter, or um, um, raise raise Lazarus from the dead. You know, it's it's funny you mentioned that story, Richard. I was only reading that to my six year old son this evening in bed. So, so the, the healing of and and it comes at the point where the power has gone out of Jesus as a woman touches his hem on the way to. Well, to I her. don't think Francis um, believes in those. Francis, I mean, do, I mean, do, do you do you believe? Okay, well, let's let's. Yeah, do you believe in the these miraculous I do. healings of Jesus? I think they are recorded by reliable witnesses uh, who observe these things to happen, uh, and I have no reason, therefore, to question them more than I do to question the uh, resurrection, which is the most critical miracle of all. And without resurrection, my Christian faith really doesn't have any substance. Yeah, but okay. I mean, so 
you don't intervene with earthquakes, you don't do any other miracles, no, no miracle. And then suddenly, uh, during, during a 30-year period um, from, from, from 0 AD to 38 AD, a whole space of miracles happen. It doesn't add up. Well, it was not just any 30-year period, Richard. It was the moment where God actually became human. And if there was ever a moment, therefore, where the miraculous could be experienced by humanity, that would be it. But you must see that you're you're being you're being unscientific there. You're you're suddenly departing from um, everything you've been saying. You, you must see that you're applying uh, your own view that anything that can't be explained naturally uh, must be a, an intellectual error. And you and I are different in that regard. I'm allowing the possibility of the supernatural, a creator God who's responsible for everything. Yeah. I'm kind of amazed, actually, that you. That I don't want to get into biblical scholarship, but you you must be aware that a, a huge number of biblical scholars don't take all the miracle stories seriously. I am aware, and I will be happy to listen to their arguments uh, if there are specific ways to discount one or the other. When it comes to the resurrection, though, please read Tom Wright's wonderful book, The Resurrection of the Son of God, if you want to see the kind of scholarship that anyone would want to ask for, for the most significant miracle of all time. Let's just return to the issue of, you know, the fact that, as you said, Francis, that um, as much as there has been this this disease uh, and the way that COVID has ravaged the earth, and th there has been an extraordinary response from the scientific community and an incredible amount, despite the politicization that's inevitably happened of it, an incredible amount of human sacrifice and uh, willingness to help people, um, you know, here in the UK, certainly, you know, the whole point of the lockdown was really to, to protect the most vulnerable. Um, and, you know, there, there's an argument there, and I'll put this first to you, Richard, that 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 very instinct to protect the most vulnerable to to make sure that the elderly are not simply you know gone because of this disease and everything else even if the the younger sort of more fit members could have could have you know rode it out uh you know without all the interruption to life and everything that, that that's not a very evolutionary way of you know looking at life it's it's not survival of the fittest we seem to have decided that actually humans should not be subject simply to the natural processes of, of what happens that we're going to use every gift at our disposal to hold on to life and to to value the life of even the most you know vulnerable individual a baby a, you know someone with down syndrome a, a person with you know uh, and and that you know and many people have, have said there's something of the divine in that and i, th I suspect francis might might say that so what I'll let Francis re respond to that. Well, he more than suspect. I mean, <laughs> he says it in 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 the language of God, um, and and it's 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 the beginning of the, of the book, and it's where he's quoting C.S. Lewis. We come to that. Um, I said earlier that I thought it was deeply unimpressive, and I need to obviously yes. defend that because it, I know it's close to Francis's heart. Um, the uh, Francis says in the language of God that that. Um, Altruistic acts of this kind are ex explicable by, by evolutionary means where there's kinship involved, as in social insects, and where there's the prospect of reciprocation. And those are the, the standard uh, Darwinian explanations for altruism. And you're absolutely right that they don't explain things like caring for the elderly, uh, donating blood, um, donating to charity, all that kind of thing. This is something different, and Francis tries to make the case that um, this is a uniquely, or almost uniquely, human characteristic which demands a divine explanation, this moral sense that human ha humans have. And I, the reason I find that unconvincing is, let me give an analogy. Um, we have a sexual instinct whose biology, whose evolutionary function clearly is reproduction, uh, but we don't actually um, think about that. Uh, we, we, when we um, have sex, we very often are using contraceptives. So we have thwarted the Darwinian design. We are having sex because we enjoy sex. Now, what has happened there is that in evolution, natural selection has built into us a rule of thumb which doesn't say do everything in your power to propagate your genes. What it says is enjoy sex. It gives you a, a liking for sex. Now, 
in our evolutionary past, we would have had, uh, we wouldn't have lived in large cities like we do now. We would have lived in small bands, small uh, villages, small bands, rather like baboons, perhaps, where everyone you meet would be your kin. And moreover, everyone you meet would be the kind of person you're going to meet again throughout your life. Therefore, reciprocation and kin selection would have built into us, built into our brains, a rule of thumb, not try to work out the coefficient of relationship to the person and then decide whether to be altruistic. Just mm, be nice mm. to everyone you know. Be nice to everyone you meet. Be nice to everyone in the village. Be nice to everyone. Now, a rule of thumb like that, when you suddenly move out of those villages into the huge cities that we now live in, you're no longer living in a small village, but the rule of thumb is still there. It's just like the sex rule of thumb, in just the same way as the sex rule of thumb, which before contraception was invented in our primitive past, before contraception was invented, the rule of thumb that said enjoy sex automatically had the consequence of having children propagating your genes. The rule of thumb which said be nice to everyone automatically benefited your genes and in two ways, both kin selection and and reciprocation. It no longer does. It's analogous to having sex with contraception. But the rule of thumb is still there. That is how a Darwinian would explain mm. altruism of the form, look after the elderly. And a Darwinian the has just done that cetera. explanation. And Richard, I have, <laughs> I've heard you use the analogy to sex before, and I kind of see where you're going. But it bothers me a bit uh, that one would basically discount uh, the most noble kinds of acts uh, of human radical altruism as a misfiring uh, of some evolutionary mechanism that's gone awry. When I look around me and see what's happened with COVID, I mean, look at those people who are working in ICUs, nurses, doctors, other folks, taking care of unvaccinated people who shouldn't really have to be there, but still giving of themselves as best they can to try to save their lives and exposing themselves also uh, to becoming ill and dying themselves. That is an incredibly noble set of actions. And to dismiss that, that, that bothers me. And I think it brings me... No, I'm not dismissing. You see, that's right. I'm not dismissing. It's, it's, I agree it's noble. It's terribly noble. I mean, I, 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 think, it's, I think it's wonderful. And, and I hugely ad admire it. But I'm not dismissing it. I'm explaining it. It's well, a different thing. Well, then let me bring this to the next, next level then. And, and Richard, I appreciate your critique uh, of the way in which the language of God starts off. And I hope uh, soon to write a new edition of that where I would somewhat redo the argument about the moral law, not dismiss it, but redo it, because I think it was still a bit, uh, a, a, a bit unformed. But the question I want to come to is this whole question then of morality and where it comes from, and why do we as humans have this universal sense, regardless of what point in history or what culture we're in, that there is such a thing as good and there's something called evil we disagree profoundly based on our culture about which actions are good and which actions are evil, but we don't disagree that there is a difference and that we are somehow called to work on the things that are in the good column and avoid the things in the evil column. I can see the evolutionary argument that that is basically burned into our DNA and our brains by the way in which it has allowed our, our species to survive. But does that then say, and would you say, that those are basically concepts that we've been hoodwinked about, that there really is no profound significance to morality at all? It's all a, an illusion? But when you talk about evil, uh, I mean, and good and evil, I mean, it, isn't it enough to say good is what good people do and evil is what bad people do. You don't, you, you don't need to invoke a kind of spirit of good or spirit of evil. It's not something hanging out there in the air. It's just uh, a description. No, but we have some sense uh, about how we evaluate particular actions that seems to be universal to humanity. Yes. Oh, that I, was I, I don't find that thing. a problem. That was admirable. Mean, that was noble. I mean, we, we, we have uh, a same, we, we have a sense of beauty. Uh, we, 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 we have a sense of... Well, there's another one. Where does that come well, from? No, <laughs> I was hoping that's we why I, I, I raise it. I, I mean, peahens have a sense of beauty, which is why peacocks look the way they do. Um, it's, 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 it's not 
uh, I mean, it, it's, it's wonderful and, and it requires explanation, but it has an explanation. And in the same way as beauty is something which we can understand, uh, um, the same way peahens have a sense of beauty, we can too. Um, I don't see it, that evil is anything different really from that. It's just, it's, it's, if, if I see somebody torturing a kitten, I say that's evil. But I'm not saying he's imbued with the spirit of evil. I'm just saying he's a nasty, bad man. I, I suppose the the place where I often see that the difference is that that while you, you we may all go along with the evolutionary explanation that tells us why we do the thing, you know, we, why we have this sort of moral code, if you like, even if we we accepted that was a sort of you know a reasonable explanation. There is still that sort of so-called is ought difference, isn't there? And, and the fact you can explain what is doesn't necessarily explain why we ought to do that. I mean, do you think, you know, if you don't believe there's a God saying you should fulfill your evolutionary sort of potential, what then why? What what is the sense in which morality is binding on anyone, Richard? I suppose is is perhaps the next question. Why why well, should I mean, we uh, uh, obey these moral principles that may be burned into us by our y evolutionary story? Y y yes. Um... Uh, the, the, the first thing I would say is 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 that um, I very much hope we that we don't get our morals from any of the Abrahamic religions because it would be a horrible world to live in if we did. Um, I think. But well, where well, do we get yeah, them go, from? Go yes. Well, I mean, where do we get them from is a very interesting question, and and what I notice looking at history is that they change um, in a good way. I mean, um, as Stephen Pink has pointed out in his several of his books, like The Better Angels of Our Nature. Um, as the centuries go by, we are getting a lot better, getting a, a lot a lot nicer. I mean, we, you know, we've abolished slavery, we now res respect equal equal respect to the, to the sexes. Um, we, we don't torture animals. Uh, if we, well, perhaps we still do, but we should, but we're kind of getting a sense that we shouldn't, and, and certainly less than we used to. Um, so there is what I've called a, a changing moral zeitgeist, which you can see happening actually from decade to decade. I mean, when uh, when I was young, um, there was a lot more racism around than there is now, a lot more sexism around than, than there is now. So things are changing. I hope and, I hope that's a monotonic curve. I worry a little bit about the confidence. Uh, yes, yes, I yeah. know. Yes, but whatever it is, it's 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 not coming from outside I mean, it's it's a it, you can think of it as something in the air but i don't mean anything mystical by that i mean it's a combination of journalism of dinner party conversations of um parliamentary decisions of decisions in courts of law um moral philosophic uh, arguments uh written in learned journals and filtering that down there's a whole lot of different things that have led to the shifting moral zeitgeist such that we've abolished slavery um sexism and and uh racism are, are now unrespectable in a way that they used well, not to be i'd be interested in in your response to all of that francis what, i mean do you think that it that is kind of the way it works morality is just the the whatever our culture delivers us at this moment. It's no, I was trying to say otherwise. I was trying to say uh, and read uh, the appendix uh, to C.S. Lewis's book, The Abolition of Man. It's a wonderful appendix, kind of walks through all the cultures that Lewis had studied. And he was a pretty good scholar pointing out that there are no exceptions. They all had this concept of good and evil. They interpreted it in very different ways, and perhaps we are now interpreting it in different ways as we make the Steven Pinker kind of progress. But the point here is that humans, for all of history, have never disagreed uh, that there is something that we are supposed to do. Where does that come from? We're supposed to be good. We're supposed to avoid the evil. I just have a big problem seeing that as a purely evolutionary consequence that has no deeper meaning. And this is where I do get to the point of morality. And Richard, I do see that if I was looking for a signpost of something that said that God might be interested in me and God might be the ultimate example of holiness, here I find it. And I'm puzzled by that. And I think lots of other people are as well. Where does morality come from? Basic evolution doesn't quite answer that. That's for me. Um, um, uh, but 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 as you say, I mean, it's it it it's, it changes. It's, di it's different in different cultures, and as I've just been trying to say, different in our own culture as the decades go by. Um, 
And I, I find... But, but, but Richard, let me press you on that. I agree it's different in different cultures, but the concept that there is good and evil is not different. It's just discussions about what fits into which category. Where does the concept... I can't imagine what, what it would look like if it, if it wasn't. I mean, what, what, how, how could a society not have some kind of idea that um, if, if, if so-and-so steal somebody else's canoe or steal somebody else's pig or something in, the, in, in, in some society, um, so, um, th that, that would contravene the, the conventions of the society and would be regarded as bad, therefore. And re would require some sort of bad outcome for the thief. Uh, but where would justice come from there? That we also need to be generous. Uh, we need to be uh, big hearted when we're seeing people um, who have done the bad thing. We need to figure out how to forgive them. Where does forgiveness fit? Well, I think forgiveness might be not a very universal thing, but, but I mean, you might find quite hard in some societies to find forgiveness but but in any case but we admire that i mean look at the terrible shooting in charleston and dylan roof who killed those people and then they found it possible to forgive him and we look at that at least i do and i think that is an amazing example of human noble actions i do too but, but it doesn't require God. anything mystical I mean, what, what why do you have to reach but out why do we care about why, why do we see it as so beneficial as opposed to, well, that was something they just decided to do. It enlivens us. It, it enriches us. It makes us feel like there's something more to humans than just, you know, the mechanics. Well, you might say, why, why, why do we feel sexual desire? We, we, we know why that is. And I, I tried to put a case for why we feel altruism and, and because, because of one, once living in these small villages. And, and so, yeah, it didn't quite work for me, though. Again, Richard, mm. you're, you're taking a particularly impressive and somewhat puzzling aspect of human behavior, uh, radical altruism, the sort of Oscar Schindler who risks his life and ultimately loses it for people he doesn't even know, and saying, well, it's just a misfiring. It doesn't set well but, 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 with okay, one's Okay, mis misfiring so doesn't have to have the pejorative connotation that you've, that you've, put, you've put on, on it. I mean, you could say that the desire to um, adopt a child, I mean, many people adopt a child. Now, that is a misfiring, but that's not a pejorative. I mean, it's an admirable thing to do. It's a wonderful thing to do, but it is a, a misfiring of the Darwinian impulse to, to want to rear a, a child of your, of your own. And that's fine. It, it's a beautiful so thing. Why do we admire it? Well, we, we have the desire to rear a child. You know, we have the desire to rear a child for good Darwinian reasons, which you and I would agree with. Um, but then when, when a couple cannot have a child, they have that desire. It's like the desire for sex, which, which you still have the desire, even though you're using a contraception. Similarly, you still have the desire for a child, even though you are, for one reason or another, unable to have a child of your, of your own. So you adopt one. Now that is technically a misfiring. But please don't think that I'm saying anything that, that pejorative about it. On the contrary, I think it's noble, as I do, as I think the sort of um, uh, Oscar Schindler behaviour is extremely noble. But but presumably, Francis, as in, we'll have to start wrapping this up because I'm, I'm aware you've given me both a great deal of time and it's been fascinating. But but presumably, you believe that that noble the nobility we see in in such an act goes beyond just an evolutionary thing you you believe that there's a sort of there's a real right and wrong that exists in the universe that we're kind of sort of you know seeing and acting upon in that sense i do see that and i am not happy dismissing it on purely materialistic grounds well, those who study sort of what's exceptional about humanity they always come up with these three characteristics of what it is that we are attached to uh, one is truth, which at the moment is a little bit <laughs> underneath fire, at least in my country. Another is goodness. Where does that come from? And the third is beauty, uh, which we touched on and which I also think can't be dismissed as we're just peahens. We see beauty in yeah, equations. Yeah. <laughs> we see Francis. beauty uh, in music and in a patch of pink in, this, in, the, in the western sky at sunset. And it doesn't seem to have a whole lot of evolutionary benefit to us. And yet it matters. And it also lifts us in a certain way into a plane of something other than the sort of pure dailiness of our experience.
some glimpse of something what Lewis calls joy, where you have just this sense that there's something more, if I could just grasp it, and then as soon as you try, it's gone. And that feels to me like a real significant experience that should not be dismissed as a neurotransmitter that just no, but, 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 lost but its You keep way. using words like dismiss. I mean, it, it, I don't dismiss it. it I... I it, I exult in it. I mean, it's a, it, it, it's wonderful. Um, it's right. it's beautiful, mm. and and the fact that you can give it an explanation is not to dismiss it or demean it or or, or reduce it in some way. Um, yes, I mean a, a sense of of beauty, the sense of the the enjoyment of Beethoven. It it is actually firing of synapses in your brain, but that's not to demean it. It's still wonderful. And incredibly wonderful, and it's not a, a Polkinghorne's uh, line comes to mind that beauty is not something we should dismiss as just evolutionary epiphenomenal froth on the surface of an uncaring universe. But that that, that, that emotive language again, which it's it's not dismissing, it's not froth, it's wonderful, <laughs> but it's explicable. Well. Okay. Well, look, we'll agree to disagree on this one, but it's been a real pleasure having having the conversation between you. But perhaps we'll go out to some uh -huh. music if we can dig out that track of yours, Francis. For now, thank you very much, um, Richard and Francis. It's been a thank stimulating conversation uh, and one that's been done in in in, in a great uh, spirit of respect. It's wonderful to be able to talk with you again, Richard. I was looking forward to this. Yes, uh, great this pleasure. This has really been a pleasure. Yeah. You're both be welcome. All the best. Thank you very much for being with me on the show today.